everybody. I'm Pastor AJ Houseman, and welcome to 10 Foot Pole, a podcast to dig deeper into aspects of the Bible that get glossed over or totally ignored in most preaching. The Bible has a lot of parts that are racy, uncomfortable, and sometimes downright horrifying. Let's talk about it. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 15. Today, our guest is Bishop Bill Goal, who is the Bishop of the Delaware, Maryland Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, um, and kind of my boss. Uh, hardly, but thank you. <laughs> Definitely my bishop. Um, thanks for joining us today. I'm really excited that you're here to talk about this uh, particular gospel lesson. I don't know why. It's one of my favorites, and just when I saw that it lined up for us to talk about this, I was really excited. I'm excited too, and it's so good to have a chance to visit with you and think with you. Uh, it's reminiscent of when we could be together for pericope study. I know. Good times. Mm. We miss you in Baltimore. I miss being in Baltimore. Though it's mm. like 78 degrees here, and I don't hate that as much as I thought that I would. No, it's pounding rain here today, oh, so see. and it's, uh, it's in the 50s, so it, it's just... Just warm enough to be not freezing and just miserable enough to be another day in Maryland weather. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> That's right. Um, we are going to talk about today the gospel lesson for Sunday, March 12th, for those that are planning on going to church. Um, and it is John 4, verses 5 to 42. Don't worry. Just everyone's wanting to smack the cat off of the off the table. That's, that's all that's happening over here. Oh, good. Oh, good. Um, he likes to be a part of everything. Anyways, um, verses 5 to 42. So this story is, is generally typically called the woman at the well story. Um, it's a fun encounter. We're going to read it. It's a very long gospel lesson. Um, and so I'm going to read part of it. Um, and then the bishop's going to read the second half, um, from the new revised. So Sorry, what go for those, up, for those uptight Lutherans, they can keep their seats. Yes, that's right. Um, this is one of those gospels that typically, like, um, if if you're at like a, a church, like a Lutheran church, where you would stand for the gospel, your pastor might be like, "It's okay, you can sit down. This one's really long." Um, and I always like when I do that, and I look out. You can always see there's at least like two little old ladies that are giving you the eyeballs. Like, are you <laughs> sure? We might go to hell if we sit for the gospel. <laughs> Anyways. All you out there, I hope that you are seated. John 4. So he came to a Sumerian city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A, a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir. I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, 
but you say that the place where people must go to worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews, but the hour is coming and now and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the father in the spirit and truth. For the father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then, Jesus' disciples came. They were astonished to see that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, his disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of that woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to this woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks for helping me read um, this nice long gospel lesson. Um, like I said, this is one of my favorites and, uh, you know, for, I'm sure you feel the same way, or maybe your memory is better than mine. Um, but as someone that, you know, has gone to church, typically many, you know, majority of Sundays, uh, for my entire life, you know, you hear a lot of sermons and there, there's some, there's just a couple, you know, like a small handful that just stick with you. Um, yes. And this, there's a particular sermon uh, by Pastor Lauren Jenkins, uh, formerly Muratori, that preached yeah. on this once that just like that is always her sermon with that is always what sticks with me on, on this particular um, text. It's a good one. Maybe I'll find permission from her to, to share that. I find Pastor Jenkins to be a devastatingly good preacher. Um, she is, yes. I'd like, to preach, yeah. I'd like to preach like her when I grow up. Same. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Uh, my wife often says that she is that she, that's the only person she's interested in listening to their sermons. And I was like, well, that only hurts just a little bit, but it's totally fair. <laughs> oh, golly. I'll tell you, uh, you and I have in our circle of friends, some really devastatingly good preachers. Yeah. And I think of Pastor Lauren, I think of Pastor Tamika Youngsevich. Mm -hmm. Um, Pastor Sarah Garrett Cray. Um, mm -hmm. My goodness, every time I hear them, I feel like, wow, I got to step up my game. <laughs> well, this is why they have also been guests on the on the podcast uh, <laughs> this year. So uh, Pastor Lauren will be a guest at some point in time. Um, she is a consistently a person uh, that continues to tell me no, but what? I will keep asking. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. <laughs> That's so why right. is this one of why is one of this why is this one of your favorite encounters with Jesus here? 
I, it's one of my favorite encounters with Jesus because of this conversation that he has with this woman, um, because of sort of the, the scandalous nature to it, right? Like he shouldn't be there. She shouldn't be there and they shouldn't be talking. And yet Mm -hmm. this is where we find Jesus. This is where we find Christ, our savior in this place. He shouldn't be talking to a woman that he shouldn't be talking to. And, um, you know, offering her this, this, this glimpse into, um, what it means, you know, talking to the Messiah. Hmm. I love this text too, because I think the church has attributed to it a salaciousness, Hmm. that same idea that you're talking about, you know, the idea that, uh, the wrong woman is talking to the wrong man at the wrong place at the wrong time without others looking on adoringly to legitimize the encounter. Mm-hmm. And in fact, you can tell, even in the reading of the text, you can tell the fibrillation and anxiety that this, uh, that even coming upon it and witnessing it is causing Jesus's disciples. Right. Like, I can't believe he's doing this. Exactly right. And in, you know, typical fashion over the years, that salaciousness has been exaggerated that, you know, somehow uh, this woman is a woman of ill repute because mm-hmm. she's not had you know, just one husband. And so I th- what troubles me is when I hear preaching about this, it focuses so much on shaming uh, yep. this woman's sexual past. Yeah. And, and, and so what's interesting about that is we actually give get no information why she has had five husbands. Um, could they have all, could, could she be a widow? Cause you know, we also know in, you know, in the law, right? Like if your husband dies, you would, then, um, the brother would become your husband and then another brother or something. There's also a possibility that like she could have been forced into, um, certain marriage situations. Um, you know, we don't know, we get absolutely no information, but you're right. That is a focus that people like to say that she is a, a sinful adulteress, woman well there are some clues that perhaps there's something um in her own heart and spirit that resonates with that but my sense is that it's the same my my reading of this is the same way that i am bothered by hearing that preached that way it's that it's we look for this you know for the the sordid detail and we exaggerate uh what what little bit that it that that is there um and I, and I really, I think that we overemphasize it to make Jesus into more of a savior. Mm, yeah. And, 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 I, and I'm not, I'm not clear that that's, has anything to do with what's happening here. Uh, I think that um, sex shaming uh, makes it easier to lift this up as a story of, of redemption, but it's not really. It's not. Jesus is not. Jesus is not challenging her sexual past here. He's he's encountering someone whom he is um, obviously invested in. Uh, otherwise, why would they even have this encounter? Mm-hmm. Jesus doesn't need physically the water that she's drawing. Uh, Jesus doesn't need to uh, show himself to be the Messiah by proving it to her or to anyone else for that matter. Mm-hmm. And the disciples are certainly not picking up um, uh, the the lavishness of God's grace in this by their by their witness. So no, I think that I mean all that they see going on right is some of these social things at play that I think. Right. Mm-hmm. That's that, I mean precisely right, and so it really I find it frustrating when we when we lean into it. When I read this passage, I, I see of it, you know, a tremendous sense of witness. You yeah. know, there's there's this encounter between the woman and Jesus, and the woman is not uh, unversed in religious things. I mean, she she she's ta- she's talking, and she knows something of what she's talking about. And, yeah, you know, Samaritans and Jews, and I mean, she knows some theology. She's thought about spiritual matters, and. and and she and and she can articulate the controversy between the Jews and the Samaritans, and the real clue to that is the where God might be worshipped um, appropriately. Yeah. Well, there's and another. 
Oh, I was going to say there's another piece of that too about you're talking about the, you know, um, I, I think we've talked about this before in the podcast is sort of like the Samaritans um, and and the Israelites. They they kind of clash. They're they're not not friends and we don't totally get a good reason uh, as to why. Uh, but so like, that's why like that it's crazy. Like it's, you know, it's that he would be talking to her, right? Like this is not normal. Um, first of all, that, that she's a, a woman. Um, and then second of all, that they are of these sort of um, pitting nations. Um, but one thing that she does that I really love that I think breaks down some of that border, that, that boundary there is she says, our ancestor, Jacob, yes. right, it mentions the shared ancestor, that they have shared ancestry, that they have, you know, all of this shared past and history um, that, you know, kind of, I think, brings them together, that she's the one that reaches out to Jesus and says, we're not that different. I, I think that that's really spot on. And I think that it should challenge us as preachers and listeners to think about this text perhaps from another angle than we've become accustomed to. Yeah. I think that we've given into the church and frankly, this little town uh, where um, people have written this woman off as a bad sort of person. Mm -hmm. But if scripture reveals anything uh, in her personhood is the heart of someone who's thirsty for God. Yeah, I agree. Um touching on this whole like when we try to like look at this uh the scandal piece to it right like people often you know very focused on all of her husbands and what that means about her um but i think that there's a, a couple other pieces um that go with this of sort of to me what's kind of what's scandalous about this and what makes it beautiful because of that um you know again that like really neither of them sh should be there um her particularly so typically at this time to my understanding um, women would have gone to gather water early in the day before it got hot. A high noon is not a time that you would have done that. Um, and so why, why didn't she go get water early in the morning with the rest of the women? Um, what may tell us is that maybe she was unwelcome or that there's something else going on in her life that would have prevented her. So she is now going to get water at the worst time of the day. Right. Um, and so she's out there and she comes across him. And um, the fact that he talks to her for their social norms, both that he is an unmarried man speaking to an unmarried woman without the presence of her father, or if she was married without the presence of her husband, let alone the fact that, you know, um, he is Jewish and she is Samaritan, that like this like little divide there would have made it, you know, that he wouldn't have normally have spoken to her at all. So the fact that he engages her in conversation. Um, and what's interesting too, is this is the longest conversation that Jesus has with anyone in the gospels. Yeah. And so how does that, you know, that impact, like how important it is that this woman, we don't get a name, how this unnamed woman of a different heritage, um, that this is who Jesus spends. This is what we get our meat and potatoes, the most conversation that we have from Jesus with someone that he encounters. What does that tell us? Well, and not to not to avoid your question, but for another second, but to also say um, the scandal that you're talking about is exacerbated about what they talked about. Oh, yeah. Because Jesus is talking with a woman about things that are of God and, and frankly of the law. And conventional wisdom of the day would say, no, 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 no. You, you you can't have that conversation for all the reasons that you've mentioned, mm -hmm. but also because it was not a man's place to give knowledge of God's law. Um, and doing so would have been considered a pretty grave sin on Jesus's part. Mm. And so, you know, again, the, the scandalous nature of the conversation is exacerbated. But so, so often we lean, we lean into what makes it scandalous because of the woman. But to be honest with you, I think it, this is why the disciples react so strongly is because Jesus is ostensibly violating the law. Yeah. And I, I agree with you that I think this, the scandal is all on Jesus's part, right? Like he initiates the, the conversation. He's the one that's bringing up these topics. Um, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. like 
it is. Um, and I also love that, like, it is with a woman that Jesus is breaking these down these walls and barriers specifically uh, with with a woman in this context. Well, and you know, I think that the image of the well in the midst of all of this really does center us around what is God's action in this. And I think that sometimes we become so fixated on our human action, uh, you know, that I'll do it for myself. I'm going to save myself. I'm, you know, the 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 master of my uh, the, my own soul, uh, the captain of my own fate, kind of thing. Uh, but the the image that Jesus uses here of the well, uh, of living water, mm -hmm. uh, that bubbles up, not just for this moment, but for all eternity, is really. It's, it's quite an image that reminds us that, you know, even though we have these snapshots, these vignettes that happen in, in a particular time, Jesus is not interested in participating in that which um, is, is temporary. Jesus isn't, Jesus isn't interested in talking about this woman's past at great length, um, and I do think that your point is well taken. You know, why is she there at that hour? Well, it's definitely to avoid something. Mm -hmm. um, my sense is that it's there that she's there to avoid uh, judgment, which is probably gossiped about and passed pretty easily. Uh, Pastor Nancy Kraft, uh, who's recently retired, uh, had had this marvelous discussion in her book called Threads. And, and she talked about how um, over a long ministry um, that the most Jesus-like thing we could do as leaders among leaders is help churches to see that the foundation of our mission is to be loving, not judging. Mm. Yeah. And this kind of text in its preaching and its teaching, and even in our hearing, invites all sorts of judgment. And I guess what I'm looking for is wh what is where is the loving piece here? I see to me that's to me it invites the opposite, right? Like you may, like those that like want to go straight from judging, like even if you were to decide that like oh she is such a scandalous you know woman, um, the fact that like Jesus doesn't judge her and offers these mm -hmm. gifts, uh, that is where I think we should take our our key from. I think that I, I would agree with you. I think that the the problem that I'm going to have in my own preaching preparation is why does he do what he does there? Why does he why does he do the little husband thing? What is it a trick? Is it to demonstrate power? Is it to demonstrate knowledge? Is it to point that perhaps she is looking to satisfy her thirst with the wrong things or the wrong people? I. I I do, but my sense can I, is can i give you a, a literary uh a possible literary reason that it's there sure um i read this just on on working preacher i do not remember who the author was uh but that a literary thing to go with it is a, a well uh two well encounters from the torah that the audience would have been familiar with one of mm -hmm. which where uh both isaac and jacob meet their wives um, are at wells and so for the audience's perspective um and also might have been on jesus's mind right like could it be a thing of like oh but who's your where's your husband um that well i have no husband that they may be setting up um, a situation where you would think that this is going to be some kind of romantic encounter and so that the fact that it's not is again we have here jesus turning the situation on its head like he normally does yeah, that's helpful. I, um, that's one possible literary <laughs> reason that it's there. No, it's, I think that's a helpful way to continue to deconstruct um, buying into that her shamefulness, yeah. real or imagined, should somehow be a barrier from community. And, you know, it's it's really interesting to put this conversation against the conversation that comes before it. Yes, because, that, you know, yes. Conversations. It comes right after Jesus and Nicodemus. Right. So um, Caroline Lewis uh, has, from Luther Seminary has some good that talks about uh, some good work talking about 
the that this is intentionally this woman is intentionally a stark contrast to Nicodemus, which is the story that we read that comes right before this. So Nicodemus is um, is a Pharisee, uh, a named man, um, and it, you know pretty high up in the Jewish hierarchy. So we have on you know they're they're literally um, in direct contrast that we have him and he comes to see Jesus um, in the middle of the night under the cover of darkness. Um, and when we see Nicodemus again, we don't hear that he has gone and done any evangelizing. He has not shared the good news. He does not stick up for Jesus. Um, and then we have this, this woman, not right. where she's supposed to be someone that he shouldn't be talking to from a, a, you know, she's a foreigner. She is a woman. We don't even get a name for her. That's how, you know, this insignificant that she was in the time period, right. As opposed to this named man of the Sanhedrin. Um, who Jesus offers this gift to, who goes and tells and becomes the first evangelist, uh, that tells everyone about him, um, that those are intentionally meant to be, um, looked at in contrast, these, these different encounters. Yeah. And I think because of the length of the reading, the temptation sometimes is to not circle back. But I think that that contrast that you're talking about and, uh, that Carolyn Lewis was thinking about is really quite significant, mm -hmm. especially in how they leave the encounter. You know, Nicodemus comes under the cover of night and leaves under the cover of night. Yeah. This woman who comes trying to avoid the community goes back and with excitement starts calling to the whole community. Yeah. And, she's, and, and, and she becomes this tremendous, you know, she sort of catches on to what Jesus is saying and she races back to the village. She starts knocking on the doors, making whooping and hollering, trying to get people's attention. Um, she's she's talking to people that she's been avoiding for years. It feels like if you if you take you know the the number of relationships, uh, this is not something that happened you know in, in yeah. a month, right? Um, and so she forgets the shame that's been assigned to her hmm. because she's so overwhelmed by the grace of the encounter and and the power of 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 that interaction and what it is that that Jesus is offering and and what i really love about this is how it ends with the villagers they're talking to her yeah there's a really specific conversation that's reported and they're not just talking to her there's 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 an there's gratitude and that gratitude transforms this woman, it transforms that community. It, tra it it transforms this moment, and that's why I think you know, not to sound like a broken record, it it troubles me when all we can talk about are the imagined salacious details, mm -hmm. sexual past, because yeah. the real power in this moment is the power of reconciliation, um, of release. And not just between this woman and Jesus, not between just between, uh, you know, the heart of this woman and the heart of God, but between this woman and a community that had shamed and she was hiding from. Well, it's she interesting really, to, really yeah, mean. this gift that Jesus gives her here um, is, you know, when he talks about this gift of of this, this living water of new life, um, that in sort of a, a Johannine, there's always this uh, darkness and, you know, light, this uh, very, very poetic John. They've, they've heard me talk about it before. But we get this darkness versus light and sort of this death versus new life thing. Um, and so this new life that Jesus gives her, um, it's not any like, you know, miracle. Uh, it, it's just by talking to her, by mm -hmm. giving her the time of day that no one else would. He gives her new life and he gives her a new life that like within her community. Right. So like her life is now changed that like people listen to her. They talk to her that she's letting go of that shame. So just by conversation, he gives her new life. Yeah. Yeah, Scott Hetsky, who is with the Calvin Institute on worship renewal said it's something like this. When an alchemy of grace we see here, when the past that made her so miserable in community now becomes the doorway in which she invites others to come and know this new life, this life-giving uh, grace and love, this this life-giving relationship with yeah. Jesus. Yeah. I mean, 
And and I have to I have to confess I that has stuck with me now for some years. The alchemy of grace. Yeah. You know how it conspires uh, for for the for the purpose of redemption, but it's not for the redemption of this woman's sins. No. It is for the redemption of this world that God so loves. Yeah. Because it isn't. This is not just a private Jesus and me encounter. It causes. It causes this woman to become uh, an evangelist in the in the most beautiful sense of that word, and she is carrying one of the treasures of the church, which is the gospel. Mm -hmm. And you know, for those traditions that can't imagine, you know, a woman who preaches. How many times in the scripture uh, do the women carry the treasure that is the gospel? I mean, from the tomb back to the scared and frightened disciples, right? Mary was the whole Christian church on earth because she had the yeah. good news, the resurrection. But here we are Listen, where this yeah. unexpected, yeah. unsuspecting person becomes the agent of grace. Yeah, I listen. I listen. The first witnesses to the resurrection, the beginning of the Christian church, the first e evangelists. I agree. I love. Um, I again, that's also why the story is is somewhat special to me. Um, in the position that you know it it puts women in, and the power that it that it does give to this woman. Yes, and that Jesus is here for the whole. Mm -hmm not just for the religious elite that he met in the last chapter, yep. but for, um, for all of us. And no matter what it is, the burden that we're bearing or the shame that we're carrying or the stigma that our community assigns to us, Jesus is here for all of us. And in the power of that encounter, we are released, we are freed to share good news. Yeah. And it's not just good news that, you know, somehow is some private treasure between us and Jesus. Is it, you know, the, the love of God and Jesus Christ is always something that's intended to be multiplied in its sharing. It's never diminished in its sharing. It's only multiplied and 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 made more abundant. It's magnified in the community, which is, I think, what we we see at the end here. Um, I like what you said about the stigma that is assigned. Um, that 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 phrase, because I I think that is what we you know, if what we see going on here, right? Like there is something that the stigma that has been assigned to her, her um, that has been given by someone else, but it's not necessarily like her shame. And clearly Jesus doesn't place shame on her, um, that it is that society that's put that there. And I think, I don't know, to me, that's an important detail to think about, because I think that there's a lot of people in our world that get assigned some kind of stigma like that. Um, you know, I, I think you and I both have stigmas that get assigned to us, right. That, uh, you know, everybody does everywhere, I think. And it's, it's from an outside thing, but it's not coming mm -hmm. from that internal source. Um, especially it's not coming here from, from Jesus. Well, I, I'll, I'll say, I'll say this, um, you know, a religious pedigree, uh, if you, if you take the juxtaposition between Nicodemus and this woman, a religious pedigree no more helps you get into the kingdom than yeah. an assigned tawdry reputation keeps you out. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree with you on one point though. Okay. Is, uh, and, and and maybe I'm overemphasizing a point. There was definitely a sign stigma, but there's also a burdensomeness that mm. is obvious in this in this woman's heart. Yeah. Thus the you know, I mean. There might be a sign stigma for sure. There is a sign stigma, and but it's there's not a defiance here. You know, I don't care what anyone thinks. I'm I'm going to go to the well anyhow. You know, and and she is hiding. It's true. Yeah, she is hiding. And, and how many times, especially those of us who preach and teach and claim to live in God's grace, how many times do we hide something of ourselves as well? Mm. How many times do we give too many you-know-whats about what other people think? And, you know, I think as leaders among leaders, some of us, you know, we find ourselves in this position of trying to count the cost. But if there's something that this encounter reminds me of, it's that 
uh, integrity is its own reward. Because hmm. that's what the disciples are doing. They're trying to help Jesus count the cost, and he's not interested. They're trying to remind Jesus that he's violating, you know, some religious moray or expectation uh, as given in the law, and he's not interested. And in Jesus's willingness to risk something of himself, um, this woman is emboldened in being willing to risk something of herself. Yeah. And God, that's, that is the story of my own life and ministry. I, I stand squarely on the shoulders of so many others who have risked something of themselves, sacrificed something of themselves, whose integrity was awesome, to give me the courage to not be afraid. Mm. And, if there's, and if there's a message that, you know, I really wish that we could carry as preachers and teachers, particularly, but not exclusively, to the young people in our care. It's that, you know, when the scripture bids us to not be afraid, there should never be an assumption that we are going to be alone in telling our truth. Hmm. You know, I think that a, a sign of the of the kingdom of God coming near will be a time, the signs and visions that, Joel's, that Joel prophesies about, uh, a sign of the kingdom breaking, the inbreaking of the kingdom will be when people can speak the truth and believe that they will be believed, heard, trusted, valued, that was not this woman's experience until this encounter. Yeah. Um, I think I think of you know all of the people who have broken uh, boundaries in this church. You know. Um, the pioneering uh, women of faith who sought ordination when there were no calls to be had, those who have pursued the diaconate in a church that lauds the diaconate but can't seem to uh, figure out how to encourage it uh, to be um, paid fairly and, um, and uh, lifted up as uh, distinctive uh, but not lesser than um, pastoral ministry. I think of uh, our colleagues um, leaders of color in this church who continue to um, put their lives on the line for the gospel and for this church that they love, even when the church keeps letting them down. I think of our queer siblings who, you know, have come out to this church not knowing how they would be received. A couple of years at one of our youth events, a young man got up and said, uh, you know, uh, I don't think it'll surprise anyone to know that I am, you know, he was giving his testimony, he said, I am a gay man, and the only place where I have ever felt safe, seen, inspired, loved, and known has been in the church. Mm. And in one sentence, I was reduced to sobbing. That's why we get up and go to work. Mm. <laughs> that's, that's that's why we continue to pursue this call, uh, so that people can live more, most, more and most fully into their belovedness. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening here in this encounter. And some of us have been waiting for this, and some of us have been working for this, and some of us have been longing for this. This is the model that Jesus set for us ages ago. And we're finally starting to see the fruits. Dr. King was right. The ark bends towards justice. It, it just takes a while to get there. Yeah. I I love that. And I love that vision of, of what's happening here in this encounter with this woman. To see you just continue to, you know, add more and more why this is my favorite. Well, I, I think that um I think that we always need to deconstruct what we think we already know about a text. Yeah. I mean, I do too. This is why I have a podcast about it, but continue. Uh, I, I've heard that about you. <laughs> um, you know, just as a side note, um, my favorite uh, chapter of scripture is Luke 15, the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin and the, and the loving father. Hmm. And in that, you know, in 15, one, it says, you know, or 15 verse three, I think it is, it says, 
And Jesus told them this parable, and it's those three stories. And because of that same lectionary thing we were talking about by the length, we always cut it away. It's the first two stories, and then a long time later, it's not even the next week, we get the loving father, what's sometimes called the prodigal son. I've been at the serious work of studying scripture for preaching and teaching, but also for my own heart and spirit for more than 25 years. And I never cease to read those 30 some verses in John 15 or in Luke 15 without discovering something new mm. about who God is and how God acts. And I find that challenging and I find it overwhelming and I find it just breathtaking. And my sense is this is the kind of scripture, this this the scripture that we're talking about, this encounter is the kind of thing where I think you and I can read this for the next 25 years and discover something new about how we have come to know God hmm. and how we encounter Jesus. And um and how Jesus encounters us. Oh, absolutely. Very good Lutheran distinction there, too. I'll, uh, you know, you get a gold star. I'll, I'll tell your bishop right away. <laughs> but um, because it's transformative. It's, it's transformative every, every time. And we discover something that God has been at work doing for a very long time. I think about, so um, in part of, you know, the the previous chapter in our encounter with Nicodemus, at the very end of this encounter is where we get, you know, the most famous uh, line of scripture, um, you know, that, you know, God so loved the world um, that he, that, that God gave Jesus, right, to save this, this cosmos, um, and that what we learn uh, about uh, God that's a kind of a new way of thinking. It's not a new phrase, but like the way that it hits my brain is a little different that I think we see played out in this, uh, well, in this story with this woman too, like when I say like, this is how Jesus encounters her, um, is this idea that like God loves us, but in a way that like understanding, like fully, like you know, if we, if we had this pitted against the world of sort of like, you know, darkness and light, that if God is all about the light and stuff, but loves the darkness where we are and who we are, that, you know, that we are this, you know, somewhat, you know, not all put together, you know, out in the middle of the day when we're not supposed to be feeling ashamed, being, you know, all sorts of judgy and, you know, terrible that we can be, that like God loves us. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, in this encounter, doesn't Jesus do, um, doesn't this encounter remind us that Jesus and this woman do the hard and holy work undercover, mm. and they're by themselves at the well, and then actually it's the woman who carries it out into the open. Yeah. Um, and God does hard and holy work undercover. And God does uh, great things out in the open too. It's a that's a wonderful juxtaposition there, and uh, one that I hadn't thought about until you just said that out loud. That's another another layer to this story. So while you were speaking, I was also thinking of something funny about sure. this story. Um, I had a professor in seminary um, who's now of, of the saints and gathered to the ancestors, uh, Dr. Sue Hedahl, who taught for a time at Gettysburg Seminary uh, uh, in the art of homiletics. And Dr. Hedahl had a few um, pet peeves uh, about the preaching task. And one of the things uh, she really would latch on to is when people introduced sacramental catechesis into a text where she did not clearly see it happening. And, and the funny thing is here, I, I can hear it in a number of ways. Uh, you, know, you, you know, the living water, you know, the fountain, the well, you know, I mean, I mean, it's just begging for a baptismal comment. Yeah. And then, you know, Jesus says, oh, I have food that you don't know about. Mm -hmm -hmm. And, you know, you know, there's a, I think there's a Eucharistic feast, you know, just hiding in his cloak. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, 
And to be honest with you, I don't know that those things need to be explored. Um, the image of water is always going to point us somehow in some way to baptism. But the, the, but the baptism here is not of water, it's of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, of Jesus proclaiming redemption and release. But not just in the proclamation, but in, in the shackles that come off of this woman's heart and spirit. She, is, she has been set free. But I don't know that it was something that Jesus did to her. Yeah. It was the encounter. This is where, so what I hear sacramental in it, so a phrase that always sticks with me from seminary about the sacraments is it's, you know, it's an ordinary earthly element attached to God's promise. And so I think to me, what's sacramental about this encounter is because it is ordinary, that this ordinary mm -hmm. encounter with Jesus transformed her into something extraordinary. When I was getting ready for candidacy approval, you know, we had this long list of things that you should be ready to talk about with a candidacy committee that judges mm -hmm. whether or not you're ready to receive a call to pastoral ministry in my case um he says it the and, nice way I, I always say i was like listen they said that you need to have all these things memorized that they were gonna like yeah. you know <laughs> well when you, when you were talking about you know the the sacrament you know what a sacrament was from your memory in seminary all i can think of is um Friends at the seminary, when we were getting ready to go to our various approval interviews, were sort of cramming a little bit. And uh, there was this one guy across the room who was always like struggling to remember exactly what made a sacrament a sacrament. He he said, I, I don't know what makes a sacrament a sacrament, but I know it when I see it. And uh, he had a mnemonic device. And he would go, gift of God's grace, commanded by Christ, physical element attached. <laughs> and, just, and it just... I mean, that's 30 years ago, and I, I still I still hear that ringing in the back of my head. Uh, you know, never never to hear the word sacrament without thinking gift of God's grace. You know, uh, and and remembering uh, those things. But you know, isn't that what's happening here? You know, there's a gift of God's grace um, that comes near. The you know command of Christ or the physical element isn't nearly as present here, uh, other than as images in the background a relief against which we see the gift of God's grace. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that it's a sacrament, but there's certainly a sacramental moment. Yeah. Uh, between Jesus and this woman. So one thing that if, if your listeners uh, today, um, if they are going to share something about this text in preaching or teaching, the one thing that I am, also just always hits on my ear a little bit hard in scriptural translation is the term the Jews. Yeah, we've talked about that too. Um, I, you can go all the way back to season one, episode four with Pastor John Deason um, to really, really talk about, uh, I've talked about it several times and, and you know, to kind of call that out um, in the gospel of John. Um, it's where you hear that term the most. Yeah. Well, I guess, and I, I remember hearing that in the podcast before, and the reason I return to it is, I think that one way that we can honor this encounter and the sacredness of it is in our speaking of it to give embodied personhood to all of the people. Hmm. And that is challenging when someone is nameless to history. And for some people, it might mean assigning a name and trying to um, humanize the encounter a bit. But just remembering that these Jews, of which we're speaking, these Samaritans of or Samarians that we're speaking of, these these are people. Mm -hmm. And just attaching the word persons or people to it also reminds us that um, they're not props. I think it goes a long way in the reading to even where, you know, when we see the various phrases of the Jews of attaching the Jewish authority or the Jewish, you know, high council or, you know, the Sumerian people. Um, I think you're right. I think that does does change it. And also, I think that that challenges, you know, a lot of our historical bias that 
has gotten put into the biblical text based on how people have read that. And also how, you know, those very readings um, and that interpretation is what causes, you know, a lot of anti-Semitic sentiment um, and how historically present that's, that is in, in Lutheranism for sure. Yes. You know, I, I heard a sermon one time around this text and um you know, the preacher, I think, was well-intentioned and said something to the effect of, you know, imagine if this were your sister or your mother. And, and, and I wanted to yell, but I'm too polite because I'm Lutheran. Um, I wanted to yell, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. This person's belovedness is fully in their own personhood, not the relationship that they have with other human, you know, uh, others in their family of choice or choosing. Uh, their belovedness is in the encounter that they have with their God. And so we needn't imagine or anthropomorphize this into something about us where we're centered in the story. Uh, this, you know, it, it really is important that we think about how do we center this woman's personhood and dignity, which has been robbed from her many times by the church and is always being restored by Jesus. But it's hers. It's not ours. Mm -hmm. It's not an argument to give it back to her because it was never in our power to to rob her from it uh, of it. Mm -hmm. So, I I think when when we read the Gospel of John, of 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 all of the Gospels, um, especially with its heady introduction about the Word becoming flesh. I think that it, it it really demands that we never give in to the idea that we can disembody someone from the fullness of their personhood. And it's so easy when you use terms like those people, I mean, the Jews, mm -hmm. right? Or when someone who is really central to the Jesus story, like this woman, is not named. Yeah. It, it, it puts a burden on us to to deconstruct the idea that somehow they're 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 less than. So yeah, going that extra length, I think, is the the big piece there. So the, the, I mean, those are some of the things that I'm thinking about with this text. I mean, even our conversation, brief as it's been, uh, really does challenge me to think. Well, maybe maybe I think I think I have some things. I think I think that I think that I have things figured out. And to be honest with you, um, the courageousness of this woman, the witness of this woman, the faithfulness of this woman, the wisdom of this woman, the knowledge of this woman, um, they're inspiring. And they should challenge me as one of those people, perhaps still slinking around in chapter three, with mm -hmm. a religious pedigree. Um, but maybe I'm not all that. Uh, and that my belovedness is uh, manifest through God and in God um, in ways that I haven't fully imagined. I think that's true for all of us. And the more that we can wrap our head around that we can't wrap our head around it, maybe the closer we are to it that makes any sense. Yeah, I think it does. I, I think that um, Jesus has a lot of patience for a lot of things. Spiritual self-conceit is not one of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Bishop, for this delightful conversation. Um, I, as always, usually find myself a little wiser, I think, when I um, have conversations with you, especially uh, around scripture. Um, and um, we appreciate you coming and sharing um, some of your wisdom and grace with us on the podcast. I appreciate that. I appreciate your listeners and their support for this, uh, this work that you do uh, for us and with us and on our behalf. I also want to say thank you to you and to your family for the sacrifices that you make uh, to make this possible. Uh, this podcast gives us the opportunity to extend um, the good news of God's love 
in a very tangible way uh, in the church, through the church, but more importantly, um, for the sake of this world, um, including the world outside of the church, which is no less uh, beloved to God. So mm. thank you, and thank you for your witness. Um, you you inspire and give me courage too. Thank you. Well, I'm going to say that is the best promo material right there from the bishop um, for sharing the podcast. I appreciate it. Um, you can learn more about the podcast at 10footpolepodcast.com and find us on Facebook and Instagram at 10footpolepodcast and wherever you listen to podcasts. And the 10 Football Podcast is a ministry of the Delaware, Maryland Synod. To learn more, go to dmbsynod.org. Thanks, y'all.